Hello everyone, bonjour à tous. Uh, I am Susan Lamb, historian of medicine here at the University of Ottawa in the Faculty of Medicine. It is my great pleasure to have been asked to introduce Dr. Sarah Glassford today, our keynote speaker. People are still coming in. So welcome everyone back from lunch and we're live streaming today. Dr. Sarah Glassford is an award-winning teacher and scholar of post-Confederation social history in Canada. Following her PhD at York University, we were lucky enough to lure her here for a postdoc in the Nursing History Research Unit. And here she was awarded a Distinguished Teaching Award by the Faculty of Arts here while she was teaching. After that, she went on to teach uh, in Prince Edward Island, at Carleton, and most recently at the, at the University of New Brunswick, yes. Her history on the Canadian Red Cross, a book called Mobilizing Mercy, was just published last year in 2017, along with various other articles and scholarly chapters that you can find online. So it is our great pleasure to have her come and speak to us today. Dr. Sarah Glassford. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, bon après-midi. Hi, mom at home, I know you're watching. <laughs> uh, and thank you so much for inviting me back almost 10 years uh, since I did my postdoc here at the unit. Uh, je vais présenter en anglais, mais il me donne beaucoup de plaisir à revenir au milieu bilingue ici à l'Université d'Ottawa éduquer le français parlé. Uh, si vous avez des questions en français à la fin, vous pouvez me les demander. Uh, C'est vraiment possible que je ne les comprendrai, <laughs> uh, mais vous pouvez essayer quand même, lentement, s'il vous plaît. Uh, for the past year and a half, the sort of addition to my biographical sketch that Susan was so kind as to give uh, is that for the past year and a half, um, I've been removed from the world of historical scholarship uh, pursuing a degree in library and information science. So when Marie-Claude and Alessandra approached me about giving this talk and said very kindly, you know, feel free to talk about whatever you're researching right now, my first thought was, ha, you think I have time for research. <laughs> um, it, but it seemed like too good an opportunity to pass up to return to the world of history uh, and essentially to carve out some time to, to think about issues that I kind of left unfinished um, before I, I put my history life on hold. So I thought about what unfinished projects I had sitting on the very back, back burner uh, when I started my library degree and decided to dig into one that quite conveniently uh, or fittingly happens to have its origins in my time here as a postdoctoral scholar at the unit. Uh, and that's uh, looking into children's history, which actually fits the theme really nicely of looking at groups who are maybe traditionally underrepresented in historical scholarship and health history. Uh, and particularly looking at the Canadian Junior Red Cross, which is obviously kind of an offshoot of my work on the Senior Canadian Red Cross. So in keeping with the conference theme of revisiting events, perspectives, and voices of nursing and health history, what I'm presenting to you today is essentially me revisiting uh, a topic and a set of voices in health history that I have uh, previously researched and done some writing about um, the Junior Red Cross in the first half of the 20th century, but with a new focus specifically on the health component of the program, and I'll talk about what the other components are uh, a little bit later. Uh, since I have been immersed in studies of a very different field and discipline uh, for the past year plus, uh, and this research has kind of been my, my hobby, you could say, I'm very aware, painfully aware, um, that at this point my conclusions are both preliminary and tentative. I'm still reading, still working through the primary sources. Um, but it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you to sort of present where I'm at uh, early on in that, that re-engagement. Um, and I hope that you will help me refine my thoughts and kind of push me a little bit further by asking good questions and sharing your own insights uh, at the end. I have missed being part of this kind of historical scholarly community over the past year, and I have to say being here with you today feels a little bit like coming home. 
So all of that is a very roundabout way uh, of getting to my actual talk, which as you know, I've titled The Trial of Jimmy Germ, Health, Play, and the Junior Red Cross, 1919 to 1939. Children are frequently the subject of health care policies, health care interventions, as well as the subject of historical writing about those health care policies and interventions. But their own experiences of those adult frameworks for health uh, and particularly their voices of those experiences are much harder to access and to reconstruct. So what I hope to do today is, again, in a sort of preliminary way, not only think about why the Junior Red Cross took the approach it did to health education during the interwar years and why the program became so popular, but also to try to get some kind of sense of what it was actually like for the children who participated in it. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce you to Jimmy Germ, and please uh, forgive me, I'm going to be a little bit dramatic in keeping with uh, the subject of our talk today. Place, a room in the palace. Enter the queen, she saw, sinks, sighing on the throne. Oh, what a wretched kingdom this! It seems that everything's amiss. My subjects, they are tired and lag, and all their work just seems to drag. Disease and plague are everywhere. Such suffering I cannot bear. And who is causing all this grief? Tis Jimmy Germ, to my belief. Scouts I've sent to scour each way and bring this wicked germ to bay. I wonder what news they will bring. Will they come sorrowing? Will they sing? She pauses, listening sharply as footsteps approach. Enter street cleaner, dragging Jimmy Germ. Street cleaner bows before Queen and forces Jimmy Germ to his knees before her. Street cleaner. O oh Queen, our mission is fulfilled. This germ we've captured to be killed. Jimmy Germ. I will not be killed. I will not, I say. Street cleaner. Shall I take this fellow away? Queen. No, you are dismissed. Now for your case, if such you have, you fellow base. Jimmy Germ. I'm Jimmy Germ, a villain rare. I hate clean folks and I hate fresh air. I'm a troublemaker and spend my time looking for victims for my style of crime. If I find a boy who likes to scrub and is not afraid of his daily tub, I shun him, for tis plain to see there is no room on that boy for me. What I like best is a dirty boy. Dirt brings disease and brings my joy who sleeps in impure air all night with doors and windows all shut tight. On him I find a home until I multiply and make him ill. Then we enjoy his misery. Oh, a villain's life is the life for me. This little dialogue comes from a one-act health play written for children by Catherine Howard that appeared in the Canadian Red Cross Junior Magazine in June 1928. Now, Shakespeare, it is not. <laughs> so I will spare you the rest. But in case you're wondering, Jimmy Germ is sentenced to death by the queen, which is carried out in rhyming couplets by her warriors sunshine, fresh air, soap, carbolic acid, and a tea kettle of boiling water. And in the end, now banished from the land, the queen sends Jimmy Germ's carcass to the garbage can. From 1922 to 1939, dozens upon dozens of plays, stories, rhymes, pageants of a similar nature appeared in the Canadian Red Cross Junior Magazine, which was the children's magazine of the Canadian Junior Red Cross organization. And letters and photographs sent to the editor from branches across English-speaking Canada and then printed in the magazine offer evidence that children did in fact read and perform these pieces in their schools as part of their wider involvement in the Junior Red Cross program of health and citizenship education. But health and citizenship education were already part of the curriculum in all the English Canadian schools of every province before the 1920s. And the health information, the actual content of this program provided by the Junior Red Cross was not new. It was not being invented by them. They were recycling a lot of these materials that they were present, pr uh, printing in their magazine. So my question when I think about this, this program and its surprising popularity is why did it become so popular if it's not really doing or giving anything particularly new? So I would like to suggest that that popularity in the interwar years stems from two factors. First, on the adult side of the equation, uh, and as Nancy Sheehan argued back in the 1980s in two excellent articles, uh, because teachers, particularly in rural schools, appreciated the program as a provider of teaching resources 
at a time when such resources were relatively scarce, so a very utilitarian uh, reason for this popularity of the program. Second, on the children's side of the equation, and this is where I'm kind of venturing into exploratory territory, I think the popularity may have to do with the fact that the program in, uh, embraced a progressive, child-centered approach to teaching that gave children agency in their learning, emphasized hands-on activities, and crucially, this is where I want to end up in this talk, uh, framed health education as a kind of play. And all of this, it did at least 10 years, possibly 15 in some cases, before that type of progressive educational approach began to be written into the official curriculum in the different provinces. So in other words, I think the Junior Red Cross Health and Citizenship Education Program flourished in the interwar years because it appealed to teachers and it appealed to children. So before we delve into the reasons why teachers and students alike embraced the Junior Red Cross world of Jimmy Germ and his friends and enemies, uh, a little context I think is in order. So the Canadian Red Cross Society uh, was founded in 1896 with a pretty narrow mandate to aid the sick and wounded on battlefields uh, in wartime. So a long way basically from Jimmy Germ. Although the society was small and unprepared for the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, it rapidly expanded thanks to grassroots enthusiasm and specifically women's desire for socially acceptable means of participating in the war effort. So for four years from 1914 to 1918, Canadians gave their time, money and skills to the Red Cross Society allowing it to provide hospitals, ambulances, comforts and recreational facilities, invalid foods, medical supplies, prisoner of war food parcels, and a tracing service for the missing and wounded. The war years developed an enduring relationship of trust between Canadians and their Red Cross, established the society as a truly national organization, and led the society to expand its mandate into peacetime public health work beginning in 1919. So that, of course, is where Jimmy Germ comes in. During the First World War, children also worked for the Red Cross in their schools, in youth organizations, and as contributors to adult Red Cross efforts. Uh, they raised money to purchase ambulances and supplementary health supplies. They created sewn and knit and comforts for sick and wounded troops, essentially the same things that adults were doing. But the overwhelming majority of those efforts were ad hoc and uncoordinated. There was one exception, and that was in Saskatchewan, where children were formed by adults into independent, chartered Red Cross branches of their own, very much like an adult society, only the membership was entirely children. So that move to do that, sort of formalize these groups as Red Cross branches, began in a very small way in 1915, so quite early in the war, but then expanded in 1918 into a deliberate, wide-scale, formal mobilization of children's voluntary labor through the school system. By the end of 1918, there were more than 300 junior Red Cross groups, as they came to be known. Uh, and by the end of December in that year, they had raised more than $15,000 for the Red Cross. And keeping in mind that a dollar was worth a lot more then than it is today. So the success of Saskatchewan's school-based junior Red Cross venture uh, led the Provincial Red Cross Executive Committee to conclude that this idea merited further development as a peacetime activity. And in fact, that maybe the future of the entire Red Cross in Canada, the adult part of it, might rest on enlisting young people in the cause, sort of building generational support for the future. Saskatchewan leaders envisioned revamping the ad hoc wartime fundraising initiative and uh, or, sir, as a, a complete program of health and citizenship education that would redirect children's voluntary labor towards serving the needs of themselves and other children. So at the March 1920 annual meeting of the National Red Cross, an Alberta Red Cross leader named Mrs. C.B. Wagon proposed that the society deliberately engage children and youth in the Red Cross through a special junior membership campaign and the creation of a junior magazine. By the following year's annual meeting, the Junior Red Cross as a school-based program was well underway, so they really got on it quickly, uh, in the three westernmost provinces, and it had been planted in New Brunswick. Provincial Red Cross leaders consulted the Saskatchewan Division, which of course was the only area that had any experience with this, as well as their own local education experts to develop the new peacetime program's structure and resources. In 1921, a teacher and registered nurse, who's a dual career woman, uh, named Miss Jean Brown, who was formerly very active in the Saskatchewan Junior Red Cross Committee, 
was appointed as the National Junior Red Cross Director. She also served as the editor of the Canadian Junior Red Cross uh, magazine that first appeared in the following year. In that same year that Ms. Brown was appointed, the Junior Red Cross had 68,000 members, child members, in six provinces, Alberta, British Columbia, New Brunswick, Ontario, Quebec, and Saskatchewan, but 40,000 of those 68,000 were in Saskatchewan, so it still was kind of leading the way. That same year, the Canadian Red Cross annual report called the Junior Red Cross, quote, probably the most promising side of the peacetime work of the Red Cross, and quote, the most hopeful educational agency among the society's many new public health activities. The Canadian Red Cross was one of several National Red Cross societies that was really at the forefront of Junior Red Cross innovation. There were other countries doing this around the world, but the program was broadly conceived as international and was promoted by the new Paris-based League of Red Cross Societies, which kind of mirrored the League of Nations that was created after World War I. So each National Junior Red Cross determined its own activities. There was no kind of guiding or, or um, legislating body above it, but the League encouraged and coordinated the exchange of resources between them. So if you had a really good activity, why not share it with other countries, Junior Red Crosses? And Junior Red Cross members around the world shared a motto, I serve, and three core values that the program tried to promote. So good health, which we're going to focus on today, service to others, and international friendliness or good citizenship, kind of went by two terms. The adult idealism that drove Canadian Red Cross investment in this peacetime Junior Red Cross is very apparent in early writings and, and comments about the program. For instance, in the 1921 annual report section on the Junior Red Cross, which of course is still just getting up and running, uh, we read, when one considers the great influence of the acts and thoughts of childhood upon afterlife, it will be realized what a telling power the Junior Red Cross must have upon the coming generation. Of course, education is always about molding young minds in the directions that adults deem best, but this impulse was clearly amplified and made more urgent in the 1920s by the appalling loss of life in the Great War and a sort of collective sense that Western civilization had somehow failed by allowing such a cataclysm to occur. So they're kind of turning to youth and to children as a way to redeem their own adult failures. The Canadian Red Cross organized its 1920s experiments in peacetime public health work around the idea of nation building through health, and the school-based Junior Red Cross held pride of place in that agenda. And I've given you just two images of many from that early period. Uh, one is the rules of the health game, there were 12 of them. I'll let you read those at your leisure and sort of think about what kinds of health concerns they're trying to address. Uh, and then one of, of many uh, early Junior Red Cross groups from 1924 there uh, on the other side. So the school-based Junior Red Cross held pride of place, as I said, in this nation building through health agenda. The service component of the program was seen as one way to transmit what a lot of adults considered the only good thing to come out of the First World War, which was a spirit of service and sacrifice. You know, yeah, it was terrible, but we all pitched in and we worked for the greater good. So let's try and transmit that value onto the next generation. The Junior Red Cross also used parliamentary procedure uh, in child-run Junior Red Cross branches, and that was considered a way to give them hands-on training in democratic citizenship, while the international friendliness part of that, that third pillar uh, was fostered by international correspondence with other Junior Red Cross children around the world. But of course, physical health was another prime concern, and that was driven, uh, if you know this, this period in public health at all, it's clearly driven by a combination of very powerful factors that included the devastating loss of life in the First World War that I mentioned, the Spanish influenza epidemic that followed, the poor health, very poor health, that had been revealed among Canadian military recruits during the war, and a much broader global public health movement that was symbolized by an influential conference of public health leaders at Cannes, France in 1919. So there's, there's definitely a, an international wave that the Red Cross is, is riding a little bit here. Through health education that directly engaged students in their own health, the Junior Red Cross aimed to shape a more physically robust generation of citizens in the 1920s and 30s. Now, it's worth noting before we move on that in the eyes of its creators, adults of course, uh, the Junior Red Cross's potential influence was not limited to its school child members. 
Social reformers of the interwar period viewed school as an ideal access point, not only to children themselves, but through them to the wider community, those more resistant adults. This access was particularly valued by reformers who were, con who were concerned not merely with conserving or enhancing child life, but also with, quote, Canadianizing recent immigrant populations, both rural and urban, and improving the health and hygiene practices of the urban working classes. So again, if you look at the rules of the health game, there are some class issues maybe there in, in who would be able to uphold that or whose standards are being upheld. And we can maybe talk about that in the question period a little bit. But the idea was the Junior Red Cross would mold children kind of at the front lines and organizers hoped they would take those lessons back to their homes and start to change their own families. And interestingly, when I was doing some, some reading uh, in preparation for this talk, I found an article from last year that talked about exactly that kind of, you know, get the kids and they will force their parents to recycle better or, you know, those sorts of things. So it's, it's not an idea that's gone away. The reasons behind the popularity of the Junior Red Cross program are of particular interest to me anyway because it was a completely voluntary program. Although it was in the schools, it was not of the schools. It's an outside organization offering a program that individual teachers either took up or didn't uh, at their uh, free will. So unlike the carved in stone content of the official provincial curriculums, uh, individual teachers were always free to choose to opt in or out or how they would integrate this program into their already jam-packed timetables. So it's interesting to me that the Junior Red Cross steadily expanded during the interwar period and beyond and really hits a final peak uh, as the baby boom hits its all-time high of, of kids in school age after the Second World War. But it is also worth noting that the growth was uneven across the country and most notably, uh, Quebec's French Catholic school boards refused access to their schools at all until the Quiet Revolution, when the program actually changes to uh, sort of become more culturally sensitive uh, as French-speaking children uh, joined it in some numbers. However, by the end of the interwar period uh, in 1939, 425,000 Canadian children were participating in 14,000 branches spread across every province, while another 35,000 Newfoundland children, which of course was still a separate country at that time, were affiliated with the Canadian Junior Red Cross. Few other youth organizations in the country could boast that kind of membership or integration into classrooms. All right, so getting to the why is this becoming popular question. First of all, I want to think about the appeal to teachers. Unfortunately, I have yet to come across any kind of meeting minutes or planning documents that would explain what the formative influences were that shaped adult Junior Red Cross leaders' approaches to teaching health within this program. But even the most cursory understanding of early 20th century teaching methods and theories makes it clear that the Junior Red Cross was ahead of its time pedagogically. Until the mid-1930s, Canadian schools remained tied to a traditional model of instruction that relied upon memorization of facts, gave teachers and textbooks the central place in conveying those facts, and did not encourage much in the way of independent thought or curiosity. The Junior Red Cross, by contrast, embraced the theories, or seems to have embraced the theories, uh, most famously expounded by late 19th and early 20th century American philosopher John Dewey, which came to be known as progressive education. The new progressive approach was student-centered, activity-based, hands-on, and far less rigid and hierarchical than that traditional model. Today's classrooms, the ones that all of us were probably educated in and, and children today are being educated in, um, have been heavily influenced by those progressive ideas. So I think they seem a lot less innovative to us today than they would have in the early 20th century. The moment Friday afternoon rolled around, and Friday afternoon was a traditional slot in the weekly timetable for lighter non-core activities uh, in early 20th century Canadian schools, the minute that Friday afternoon rolled around and the teacher announced that it was time for Junior Red Cross meeting, the entire classroom would have taken on a very different tone from what it had been the rest of the week, shifting from recitation and seat work based traditional approaches to a more engaging and student centered type of learning. And I think we can only imagine what a refreshing change of pace that might have been for students and teachers alike. So the Junior Red Cross's approach was innovative for at least the first 15 years of the interwar period. 
But perhaps the most important thing to keep in mind when trying to understand the reason the Junior Red Cross appealed to interwar teachers in English Canada is the state of schools themselves in that period. And particularly the enormous challenges that faced those who taught in them. As Gidney and Miller explained in their 2012 book, How Schools Worked, there were enormous disparities among schools in this period, largely depending on the size and resources of the local community and tax base, but especially between urban and rural schools. So the three images that I have on the slide here give you just a tiny taste of those disparities. The country's largest cities, uh, on the right there for an instance, had large modern brick, brick schools with electricity, running water, all the latest technology and technologies and resources as they existed in the 20s and 30s. And a little over half of Canadian, English Canadian children attended that type of school just because of the balance of urban and rural population at that time. The other just less than half of students attended rural schools. But because rural communities and settlement is so spread out, you need a lot more schools for your students. So about 80% of all Canadian schools were rural schools. So it's kind of interesting that the split is 50-50, but there's a lot more rural schools in existence than urban. Those rural schools sometimes consisted of two rooms, but more often only one, the traditional one-room schoolhouse, in which all ages and grade levels were taught by a single teacher. Some were well-appointed and comfortable, and the sort of middle image there, which is a, a kind of historical schoolhouse that's been preserved in, in Manitoba, is a reasonably decent uh, example of that. But most were sparsely furnished, uncomfortable, and sometimes downright primitive. And the left image there is from the Junior Red Cross magazine uh, of a log schoolhouse, basically. Uh, the community was living in log cabins, and so therefore the school was a log cabin as well. Like the rural communities in which they were located, 70% of these one-room schoolhouses had no electricity, and 40% had no indoor toilets or running water for washing hands or drinking. So there's a public health disaster waiting to happen, right? Schools are already hotbeds of disease, and here you have poor sanitation and no water with which to wash your hands, communal drinking cups and all these sorts of things. So there's definitely a market, I guess you could say, for the kind of health information that the Junior Red Cross is gonna try to spread. They were lucky, these one-room schoolhouses, if they had a piano, and you can see there is one just on the left of the middle image. Uh, if they had a piano, maybe a small bookshelf of books, uh, a few maps and pictures on the walls, definitely a chalkboard, because that's where most of the lessons ended up, maybe a swing set in the schoolyard. Their overworked teachers struggled to cram a full curriculum of subjects for all grades into each week, and had relatively few teaching resources to draw on. The different uh, provincial curricula, for instance, were fairly terse in their instructions and often stated merely history, section two of the approved text, or similar, uh, for a particular grade level. So keeping order and keeping students focused and busy when there's so many different ages and grades going on in the same room required multitasking in a way that Gidney and Miller likened to being the ringmaster of not a three ring, but a four ring circus. The Junior Red Cross's innovative approach to health education made it welcome in the graded classrooms of urban schools, but its value was most obvious, as Nancy Sheehan has shown, in rural schools. Not only did the program provide a variety of free teaching resources, but it also offered a welcome way to combine subjects, again, trying to cover all of those subjects for all of those different grade levels with one human being in the classroom to do it, uh, meant that if they could pair up, all the better. So for instance, you could do health education and composition or health education and art if you participated in, for instance, a Junior Red Cross health essay contest or health poster contest. You could also engage multiple grade levels at the same time and often the entire one-room school in a single activity. So for teachers with bursting timetables, multi-grade classes, and very few supplementary resources, it must have seemed like a godsend for someone to show up and say, hey, here's some stuff, <laughs> go for it and letters from teachers that were sent to the uh, Junior Red Cross magazine and printed attest to those benefits. There is no surviving evidence to tell us exactly what the resources were that teachers received when they enrolled their classes or schools in the Junior Red Cross, but anecdotally it seems that health posters, a Junior Red Cross handbook, and the Canadian Red Cross Junior magazine were among them. Uh, and I've given you just a taste of the sorts of things that appeared in the magazine 
uh, that I think are geared towards teachers. Of course, they would be used by students, but if I was a teacher, this is the kind of stuff that I would be glad to get my hands on. So you can see uh, maypole exercises and dance. So the music is right there if you have a piano or some kind of instrument, all kinds of instructions for what to do. The Pied Piper of Health is another of these little health plays. Uh, there's some poems and rhymes there on the bottom right hand. And then a, a sort of for a higher level, an actual just full on kind of informational article. I think it's about uh, Louis Pasteur, again, on the health uh, theme. Uh, so just a taste of the kind of, of stuff that was in the magazine, and I'll show you some more a little bit later. Um, again, letters and reports of Junior Red Cross branch activities written by both students and teachers make it clear how central the magazine was to classroom lessons, and not only in health and citizenship, but also nature study, history, and English. And, and they really do cover a fairly wide variety of topics well beyond health. In 1932, a junior branch in the Chin Cooley School District near Foremost, Alberta, for instance, uh, used the magazine when they made a 20, or they had used the magazine in the lead up to making a $22 donation to the Junior Red Cross Hospital in their province. They had raised funds through the sale of their own woodwork and fancy goods work uh, and a program that they put on for the local community. Most of the material for the program, they wrote, was taken from the Junior Red Cross magazine. Maybe they performed Jimmy Germ, I don't know. The usefulness of the magazine as an addition to a meager school library was also suggested by the fact that in 1930, the editor of the magazine explained that some branches had kept all of their back issues of the magazine, bound them into hardbound volumes, and created their own indexes so that they could look up certain topics quickly and easily. So the magazine thought, hey, that's actually a really good idea, and printed that index, sort of created their own official version, uh, to health topics specifically, and then extended it in 1934-35 to kind of update um, and encourage other branches to do likewise. So it's a resource that keeps on giving uh, in some ways. All right, so let's think about the student side of this. As I suggested earlier, I think the key to understanding children's experiences of the Junior Red Cross is to understand it as a form of play. But play is a very vague term. <laughs> it's been defined in all kinds of different ways. So I want to just spend a moment explaining how I'm defining it. As Elisa Sobo writes, play is frequently cast as merely the opposite of work. That's kind of the easy definition. But a lot of theorists of play object to that play-work opposition, arguing that that can elide particular play-related play -related processes and experiences while downplaying the possibility that work can be enjoyable and that play is not always voluntary or fun. And I think that's particularly important in this context. Uh, anytime anything's happening in a school, I think it's not entirely voluntary <laughs> for students. Um, she adds that it's more useful to think of play as a mood. And I, I really like that idea, um, playfulness kind of as a mood, uh, as a disposition that colors how we experience the world. That mood of play can be fostered or triggered by particularly particular practices and contexts, such as parties and holidays, and it often sees a person become pleasantly absorbed in their activity, whether that activity is work or something else. Play as a mood is also distinguished by a lighter approach to reality as we open ourselves up to possibilities. So with that conception of play and of playfulness in mind, I think it's easy to see that play and work can blend and blur. Uh, what feels like work to one person or in a certain context can be enjoyable or considered a leisure activity to someone else or in a different context. Just as one example of many possible examples, sewing alone out of necessity for hours on end might well feel like drudgery. But sewing for hours on end in the social context of a communal quilting bee could actually be an event to look forward to. Thinking of play in this way, I think, helps explain how students may have experienced much of their Junior Red Cross work, and certainly adult leaders strove to frame it in that way. A 1930 article explaining how a school or a classroom could organize a hot school lunch, for example, explained the process not as, you know, what you could consider it being an additional burden of planning and cooking and cleaning on both teacher and students, but instead the magazine called it a school party which would combine the traditional party elements of a good time, one's prettiest members and manners, and something nice to eat, with the opportunity for role play, no less, if students were assigned to the roles of cooks, housekeepers, and bookkeepers. 
In a similar sleight of hand, if you think back to those 12 rules of the health game that I showed you earlier, uh, the 12 rules themselves were almost identical, just, just one or two tweaks, uh, to health rules that have been promoted since the late 19th century by the official hygiene curriculum in virtually every province. But the Junior Red Cross reframed those rules so they weren't just rules to be memorized, but instead rules of a game. Uh, and the difference is significant because playing a game requires that rules be acted on. If you want to win, you have to follow the rules. There's a goal or a reward there that somehow changes what you're doing. And games, like parties or holidays, are another of those social contexts that trigger the mood of play. Again, a modern day uh, parallel here in that gamification of all sorts of activities and, and, uh, and required tasks is, is an area of study. Similarly, although schools already taught students the basics of civic responsibility and democratic governance, the Junior Red Cross took those lessons and made them immersive, added an element of role play. Every Junior Red Cross branch was run by students themselves who elected a president, a secretary, a treasurer, whatever committees they wanted, governed their meetings by parliamentary procedure and decided on their own activities with of course the overall agreement of the teacher, but they were in the driver's seat in terms of what they would do among all the various options. In some cases this meant that the students themselves added further elements of role play to their Junior Red Cross work, such as that um, Joannis Pioneers branch that I showed you, the Log Cabin Schoolhouse, the group out front, uh, they decided to assign students to various chores and tasks, basically janitorial things that needed to be done around the school, but they called it playing doctor or fireman. The fireman kept the fire going. Uh, the doctor, you know, checked that everyone was following the health rules. The policeman kept the young kids off the provincial highway that was right at the edge of their school yard. So again, they're sort of adding that play element to things that basically needed to be done. And I think those sorts of imaginative additions helped to blend work and play in a way that invoked a mood of play and made Junior Red Cross activities more enjoyable perhaps than regular subject-based schoolwork. Many of the health education materials provided by the Junior Red Cross came in explicitly lighthearted packages. Health lessons or activities dressed up as stories, dramas, games, rhymes, songs, there was even a running toothbrush cartoon. Uh, no doubt students grew bored of the plots and punchlines that related, sometimes none too subtly, back to the Junior Red Cross health rules in some manner. But the format of the lessons remained more engaging, I think, than the drier, more clinical offerings of the hygiene textbooks that were approved by the curriculum. Moreover, the health content of the magazine was supplemented by activities and articles about famous people, animals, the natural world, different parts of Canada, great works of art and architecture. And since getting sunshine, fresh air, and exercise were included in the health rules, some of the magazine's content was simply games and activities that children could play outdoors. Instructions for building homemade playground equipment uh, were included in, in a few issues. So again, sort of explicitly facilitating children's ordinary play. Uh, and you can see again, outdoor games for May, just a list of things you can do outside in the spring. How to build a birdhouse, a vegetable crossword, <laughs> uh, a story about, uh, about health themes. The playfulness of the Junior Red Cross was further ingrained in the way it offered its young members ways to interact with the wider organization and take an active role in it. The Junior Red Cross was notable, as I said earlier, for its embrace of progress progressivist educational philosophy where student engagement was concerned. Branches were encouraged to write to the magazine describing their activities, to engage in international correspondence programs with other juniors around the world, and to determine the course of their regular activities. Additionally, throughout the early to mid 1920s specifically, again, as the magazine and the organization are getting up and running, they're looking for content and they opened that up to students themselves. So just one example of a number of competitions that they ran, uh, they had a health poster competition, announced the results, gave prizes, and then published some of the winning uh, posters in subsequent issues. Cash prizes and the chance to have your winning entry published in the magazine, I think, added an element of both competition and reward which brought, again, a mood of play to what could otherwise have been yet another school art project or composition exercise. Nor did the hands-on activities stop there. Through their fundraising and service efforts, juniors took an active role in their schools and local communities. 
As these photos suggest that I'm showing you here, the hands-on elements of the Junior Red Cross could include everything from making items like, on the right-hand side, this braided rag rug, which was sold, made by the children and then sold to raise money for a service project, to the kindergarten children on the left who are building a Red Cross hospital out of blocks. You can see the little flag there at the top. Uh, as part of their lesson on the province's uh, Junior Red Cross Hospital for Children with Orthopedic Disabilities. The element of play that to me is most visually obvious in the pages of the, of the Canadian Red Cross Junior is that of dressing up. And there are so many more examples that I could have given you than here, but these are some of my favorites. Throughout the interwar years, the magazine used plays and pageants as a favorite vehicle for both health and citizenship le lessons, and the frequent rep reports of school programs or photographs of students in costume that were submitted to the magazine and printed there show that, as I said earlier, students did in fact read and perform these plays and pageants fairly regularly. Of course, we all know that imagination and role play are central elements of children's natural play. And we've already seen how role play found its way into a variety of areas of the Junior Red Cross. But actually performing small dramas like Jimmy Germ added to this imaginative play the engrossing work of creating costumes, as well as then the embodied pleasures of dressing up. I can easily imagine the student assigned to the role of Jimmy Germ relishing the part of the villain, dressing up in some outlandish costume and twirling the traditional villain's mustache with evident glee. The time allotted to creating costumes, rehearsing lines and staging, and performing these plays and pageants would have constituted a clear division from the usual classroom timetable and the subject-based work they usually did, which I think, again, probably also encouraged that sort of holiday-like mood of play. A change of setting or an extraordinary event could also transform Junior Red Cross activities into playful experiences. As these photos suggest, juniors occasionally combined dressing up or special programs with other events, perhaps even leaving their school and going out into the wider community to do so. The Canadian Red Cross Junior Magazine includes evidence of juniors giving public health demonstrations at rural fairs, parading through the streets of their communities on holidays and anniversaries, playing musical instruments and forming human flags in group formation, performing plays and pageants at mass provincial meetings, and other extraordinary events. And I think as we probably all remember from our own school days, any deviation from the usual classroom routines, but particularly those types of field trips and events off school property, infuse whatever it is you're doing with a sort of festive holiday spirit. And again, it's that type of spirit, I think, that cloaks an activity in a mood of play. Children's historians are always trying to access the voices of children in the past, but it's invariably quite difficult to do so, and the Junior Red Cross sadly is no exception. Their teachers reported quite regularly that they enjoyed the Junior Red Cross, and a series of reports from British Columbia teachers in 1939, for example, gives us a nice constant refrain of how interested and enthusiastic their students were in the various Junior Red Cross activities. Another report from Vancouver Island in the same year remarked that until the teacher had begun this student-run Junior Red Cross in her class, she had, quote, no idea how resourceful they could be. The results have been amazing. Children's own letters to the Canadian Red Cross Junior, by contrast, and disappointingly, uh, are very businesslike. Their teachers will rave, <laughs> but the students themselves are very businesslike, and I sort of wonder if that's them playing that role of you know, being businesslike, being uh, an organization, they're sort of putting on that adult role in, a, in another sort of playful way. But what it means is they're very businesslike and just sort of tell you what they've been up to. Uh, I want them to gush about whether it's great or not great, but they don't. Um, however, the frequency with which they talk about playful types of activities and the fact that both Junior Red Cross enrollment and student subscriptions to the magazine, you had to pay 50 cents to get the magazine, uh, steadily climbed throughout the interwar years and beyond, suggest, I think, that a playful approach to health and citizenship education that was taken by the Junior Red Cross in this period made it as enjoyable for them as it was useful to their overworked teachers. So armed with progressive educational theories and a high quality children's magazine, the Junior Red Cross launched its interwar campaign against poor health one classroom at a time. By the end of the 1930s, poor Jimmy Germ wouldn't know what hit him. Thank you.
ideas, things I did wrong, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Another way that you can get that message. It's not explicitly dealt with as in, hey, if the four year old is saying, go kill Jimmy Germ, mom and dad are going to hear that in their seat. Um, but I think that's the assumption behind every aspect of the Junior Red Cross. I think it's definitely there. Where I think it's a little bit more explicit that if we put the kids in the show, the parents will come, is as a money making venture. Because they're constantly fundraising for service projects of a, for a variety of purposes, often given the state of their schools, they're actually fundraising for every kid to have a drinking cup so they don't have to share the differing, you know, so sometimes it's very practical. Um, and it's interesting the results that they get in terms of how much money they make. Um, there was one, and I think this probably just speaks to the quality of entertainment in Timmins, Ontario during this period, which is sort of a frontier mining area, but um, a junior class or school in Timmins, Ontario in about 1934, 35, so in the Depression, managed to attract 700 people to their, so I feel like every single person in Timmins <laughs> came multiple times <laughs> to see their little show, and they called it a peep show, and don't really describe what that is, except it sounds like, from the, the little tiny bit of information they give, that they sort of staged maybe living tableaus of famous scenes, so it was like the death of General Wolf, and you know, this sort of thing, a sleeping beauty scene, so I think it was, you know, maybe gather the adults, pull open the curtain, and there's, you know, whatever, peep at, at that, but 700 people, so they made like 700 bucks or something, and, you know, or whatever, charged a, a certain amount per, per peep, uh, and were able to buy some things from their, for their school. So there's definitely an element of luring in the adults, although I think it's mixed, whether it's explicitly for health or for money-making reasons. So maybe in like those little areas, that would be mm -hmm. Oh yeah, maybe absolutely. Areas, yeah. Yeah. Again, in Gidney and Miller's book, they talk about how, especially in rural areas, uh, the quality of a, a you know, usually young, single uh, rural school teacher was often determined by how good her shows were that she put on, because it is the entertainment. Uh, and so you can imagine, you know, if you're a struggling first or second year rural school teacher and someone sends you the script of a play and some suggestions for costumes, like, you know, hallelujah, there's half the work done right there. So. push for cross-curricular yeah. is what we're saying to our teachers. And cross-curricular, cross-curricular, integrate the math, integrate especially in junior, mm -hmm. primary. So this notion, they would have had to teach elocution, that was a subject unto mm -hmm. itself. Um, yeah, you've given them this vehicle to say, well, oh. Yeah, I, I kept thinking as I was going through it, you know, looking for sort of secondary material, it's one of those everything old is new again. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Have you ever come across um, any outside the school teacher providing the program in the school? It seems to me some of the Red Cross nurses are responsible for the junior Red Cross program. Yes. Get the teacher up even more. So yeah, exactly. I think in schools, you know, in bigger schools, where there was more than, more than one adult uh, on president. They had a school nurse. Often they would kind of uh, coordinate efforts together. Um, if it was an outpost district, uh, the nurse might be the one carrying the junior Red Cross, even just to plant it. You know, have you heard of this program? You, know, you can get things sent to you by mail that will help you. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a, a cooperation where there are um, medical and, and nursing um, personnel around. sort of the end of this magazine and about this movement you talked about the beginning, but mm -hmm. I don't know what happens next. <laughs> uh, it gets even bigger in World War II because they mobilize for war, basically, although they never talk about it as war. 
Um, they don't try to politicize children. Uh, some of the other, like British Red Cross is like, we're being bombed and we have to feed bad guys. And Canadian Red Cross, it's almost like there's no war happening. <laughs> the, the covers of the magazines are like nice animals and you know happy children. And there's you know maybe three covers of the magazine where they actually show a military person. And it's like the happiest, safest, plumpest and healthiest soldier you ever saw, you know, who's never been near a war, um, or, you know, the saintly Red Cross nurse. Um, so there's that sort of official tone of, of we're not going to make this about war, and yet all the branches are writing and saying, you know, we've sent in this money to the Junior Red Cross War Fund, and we've, you know, fundraised this, and we're making splints for the National Department of Defense, and, like, they're doing war work but in a sort of deliberately sanitized kind of way. And, and that's partly that the Red Cross is a humanitarian organization. It's not meant to be on one side or the other uh, in wartime, but just to help the sick and wounded and that sort of thing. So it's actually in World War II that they really make a breakthrough into high schools. They, they struggle a lot in the 30s to try and get the program into high schools and have very limited success, although the teachers' colleges, the normal schools, really embrace the Junior Red Cross sort of you know, hey, we could get teacher, you know, teacher candidates in integrated into this early on. Um, but the high schools are kind of the gap. And it's in the Second World War that suddenly this program offers high school students something that they're not getting maybe in other uh, venues. So it, it seems to matter more to them to be able to take an active role in this organization if they're too young to serve, but they have friends or relatives who are serving. They're kind of looking for that thing that they can do. And they get really involved in fundraising for, for war purposes in that period. So it grows through, through World War II. I think by the end of 1945, a quarter of all Canadian children between 6 and 18 are enrolled in the Junior Red Cross. So that's impressive. <laughs> in one organization, again, it's totally voluntary. Uh, and then with the baby boom, uh, after the war, they just, again, it just skyrockets. And it kind of goes up and up and up. And then as the baby boomers start to leave school, then their membership finally starts to decline. But it, the program actually stayed in schools and, and finally made breakthroughs into, um, into French Catholic schools in Quebec in the 60s. It carries on in some areas right into the 1980s. Uh, but by the late 70s and early 80s, there's a, there's a number of master's theses that were written for provincial divisions of the Red Cross saying, like, how do we keep this going? Like, we have this really good thing, but it's starting to, to die off. And, and I haven't done that research, but I think part of it is teachers don't need the resources. Schools have improved a lot. This is not the kind of play maybe that kids want to do anymore. You know, they have other options, uh, TV being one of them. Um, you know, the community's not coming out for the four-year-old pageant in quite the same way uh, that maybe it used to. So it kind of peters out and dies a sad, slow death, um, but not before rebranding itself as Red Cross Youth in the 60s <laughs> to be you know, a little less demeaning in the junior Red Cross kind of sense. Thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I just make sure a student doesn't have a question? Just, <laughs> yeah. Grandma, anyone? Okay, secondary. I just, <laughs> I just <laughs> want to ask a question about voice. Yeah. And I know you're, you're, you're in the midst of the research mm -hmm. right now, but again, I'm just thinking of my own experience as a parent. This strikes me um, so familiar as the Legion mm -hmm. competitions that mm -hmm. probably all of us did about posters or speeches. Yeah. Um, and watching my eldest son say to my daughter, who did her first Legion poster this year, if there isn't a soldier cross or a poppy on it, you're not making it at <laughs> school. Yeah. And I was kind of horrified, um, but he's right, right? Because it, it, it's they're very attuned, they're very aware of what's expected, right? Um, so I'm wondering how you're negotiating that with this idea of how do they understand how they're interpreting and, yeah. and that's something that I've really struggled in, in the yeah. things that I've, I've published about First and Second World War and the Red Cross. And it's in some ways an intractable problem. I mean, if it made it into the magazine, it's already been vetted by the teacher, yeah. probably by the students, by the teacher, by the editor, by the publisher. You know, it fits what they're looking for. Um, but I do think that like any hard to find population of you know, sort of marginalized voices, you can read between the lines a little bit. You can sort of imagine what isn't being represented. Um, I've tried to do a little bit of that where I can, and I think it's something that you know I want to. I want to find those those spots where kids are talking about their activities and, and try to say, okay, if I if I set aside the business life bit, you know, what what can we get? Out of, what are they not saying that they're doing, or you know, what are they not saying that they're liking them? Um, but when I was looking at uh, Junior Red Cross in the Second World War, 
I was able to get a surprising amount from the way that the provincial kind of organizers of, you know, so like Prince Edward Island Junior Red Cross director, um, the way that they talked about the kids' war activities through Junior Red Cross versus their regular health and citizenship activities. So the health and citizenship activities they always describe as well maintained, so they're still doing it, but the war activities, they were really, you know, energetic and enthusiastic and they think, you know, that doesn't tell me much, but it says something, you know. They're still doing the health stuff, but that's not really where their hearts are in this context. So if I can find even a little bit, you know, of something like that, I think it can be exploited to to read it to bring a front of the shelf that you're on to about Dewey and progressive education mm -hmm. and the second part, I, I, I think it's very promising. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, especially, I think, if the first question about, about perhaps selling a message and mm -hmm. getting the children to bring a message home. Mm -hmm. I think within the context of, say, Nancy Tom's book of the Gospel of Germs, where she shows that people are very skeptical about germs <laughs> at the end of the 19th century. And your talk has made me realize something new to that picture, which I spent a, I've spent a lot of time thinking about. But I think it might be promising, and I thank you for, for bringing it into my mind. And that is that if you're not one of the people looking down a microscope at a germ, then you must make a leap of faith, of theory, right? So only a few people can see the, the microbes with their own eyes. The rest of us must make a theoretical leap. So you need education, you, and I think Tomes talks about this, but maybe, maybe that's a, I think you might be onto something, that there is a connection between the message and the education and Dewey and the infiltration. It's, it's really interesting. And it also suggests that, that for the rest of us who aren't microscope lookers, that it's an imaginative act. This yeah. is what I mean, I we're already role playing a little bit to, yeah, yeah. to buy into that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's and so then, then it's not surprising that in subsequent generations, mm -hmm. the message on germs and health fades and new messages come up because yes. maybe you have more people convinced that, well, yeah, we need to wash our hands yeah. by the 1950s, you know, <laughs> duh. But yeah, well, I mean, interestingly, one of the things that uh, that I noticed most recently when I was just sort of flipping through the magazine, kind of refamiliarized really myself with, with its evolution of this period, is that it's it's full on health in the 1920s. Like there are other things, but it's like health, health, health all the time. By the second half of the 1930s, there's actually relatively little health, like maybe a quarter or less, and it's culture and art and history and science and people who are creating peace around the world as we spiral towards war and you know so I feel like a they're getting more older students so they need more than fairy poems about germs um, but also yeah the message has been taken up not just of course by the Junior Red Cross but the broader public health movement and so they're kind of trying to okay how do we fill the pages <laughs> uh, if we don't need it to all be be health plays and that sort of thing so that's a good point thank you and the Red Cross too was always trying to make itself relevant Right. Mm -hmm. They are struggling to get the next best way to keep themselves going. Absolutely. Well, let's thank you guys.